Well, good afternoon and welcome to the session for NCMR on ALEC. I'm pleased to welcome you here post lunch and um, if this is the session you've come for, you're in the right place. Uh, a couple of logistical things just at the outset. We'll be uh, live streaming this um, on the web and so uh, we'll be doing questions by note cards and uh, there will be people who will be coming through the aisles to pick up your questions and then we'll have a session at the end of the presentations uh, to go over your questions and try to answer them. Um, and so I think that that's the main, uh, the main thing I was required to tell you, you're, you're live. So keep the cursing to a minimum. Um, all right, so let me get started here. My name is Lisa Graves and I'm the executive director of the Center for Media and Democracy. Uh, that's my uh, Twitter name, I was too late to get Lisa Graves. Um, and, uh, and we hope that you'll tweet, if you do tweet, that you'll tweet about this session and you'll continue tweeting about ALEC well beyond this um, session. I'm the uh, leader of the Center for Media and Democracy and I'm, <laughs> um, I'm, the, I'm a former Deputy Assistant Attorney General and former uh, Chief Counsel and of the Senate Judiciary Committee on Nominations and a couple other posts and you can see the bio, but I, I wanted to just begin by saying um, I think of myself as a strategist and a researcher. And um, I helped put together the filibusters uh, that kept Miguel Estrada uh, off, the, off the court and kept Bill Haynes, the general counsel of the Defense Department, off the court and helped put together the filibuster of the Patriot Act back in 2005, 2006. And in that capacity, I ended up working a lot with Grover Norquist. And so I sort of saw inside the belly of the beast. Um, and so when the um, whistleblower contacted me about the ALEC bills, I knew that I had to do everything I could to make sure that we didn't have just a one-day story that we had uh, a, a, a toolbox for people to use to really tell this story. Um, and we're telling this story now in this session and we'll be telling this story tonight. Um, pizza and movies, six o'clock to seven o'clock. There are little uh, postcards on your chair. Please come. We'll be showing uh, the incredible, uh, amazing journalist uh, Bill Moyer's film, United States of Alec, Common Cause, and Center for Media Rock are, are sponsoring that. And so if you don't have dinner plans, come have pizza and a movie with us tonight at 6 o'clock. And we also have the uh, DVDs on your chair uh, that we've uh, distributed to make sure that you can take those away and show them to your friends and family and help tell this story um, in your communities. Lisa, make sure they don't watch that video until after the live video. Yes. At, uh... Not until after pizza tonight. Pizza <laughs> tonight. Okay. So let me get started. Um, this is not about Alec Baldwin. <laughs> I have to say this because when I, um, when I called to order the website, alecexposed.org, I was so paranoid that I spelled it out for the guy and I said A-L-E-C-E-X-P-O-S-E-D and he took my information. And then he said, what, what, which Alec are you exposing? And I, 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 I thought he couldn't possibly know the American Legislative Exchange Council, but still, I said, Alec Baldwin. And then he took my credit card information, and then he said, what are you exposing about Alec Baldwin? And I said, nothing naked. <laughs> nothing naked, nothing naked. So anyway, that's a little brief story about how we launched the project, or began the launch of the project uh, back in the spring of, tw of 2011 uh, that we called Alec Exposed. Uh, my organization is, um, a, uh, is, is, a, is a group that does reporting and also does investigations, and we've won some really wonderful awards for this investigation, including the Izzy, the IF Stone Award, um, and the Sydney Award, and a great, a great award from some of the academics in the media world for helping to tell the truth about this. But my organization is uh, based in Madison, but we're actually a national boutique investigative and reporting group, and um, our focus is exposing corporate spin. You may know us by our other names because we don't have a website that's called Center for Media Democracy. PR Watch, Source Watch, Bankster USA, Fix the Debt, uh, Expose, Fix the Debt, Fix the Debt, Expose, Pete Peterson's Pyramid, including this lovely postcard, Pay Your Damn Taxes. <laughs> uh, NFIB Exposed, uh, Fracking uh, Research and Reporting. Um, and so we are the Center for Media Democracy and I'm pleased to be here with this wonderful panel uh, that we're going to hear from uh, throughout this afternoon. But I want to tell you a little bit about the story of um, how we launched Alec Exposed and, and where, we're, where we're at, and then we can talk about where we're going. Um, I say that it's important to begin at the beginning because we stand on big shoulders. The NEA was one of the first groups to do a major report on Alec in, 90, in 1998. It went nowhere. The press wasn't covering it. 
people for the American way. Mother Jones, Alternative Media, was covering it in 2002. NRDC was trying to get the word out. The Isthmus was trying to get the word out. The Progressive States Network was doing a report. The Progressive, another great alternative media, was doing a report back in 2008 with Mark McCann, who's now in Congress. In These Times was reporting on this in 2010. Uh, the trial lawyers were reporting on it. And then something happened. There was a huge labor uprising in Wisconsin um, in response to Governor Scott Walker. And out of that came a New York Times piece by Professor Bill Cronin of the University of Wisconsin saying, maybe this is Alec. So he was right. Maybe this was Alec. Uh, in 2011, Greenpeace, uh, Daily Coast bloggers were on the scene. Uh, the Voters Legis Legislative Transparency Project uh, emerged. And then the other groups that were fighting this fight all along, and they knew it was Alec, but they couldn't always tell which bills were which, AFT, AFL-CIO, SEIU, AFSME, CWA, UFCW, the Unitarians, Walden, Good Jobs First, uh, In the Public Interest, CBBB, and many more were trying to tell the story because they were fighting these guys, but they didn't know how to connect the dots uh, because the bills were secret until a protest in Cincinnati in the spring of 2011. That was the first protest at an ALEC meeting, and out of that protest came a person of conscience who came forward with all of the bills that were secretly voted on by ALEC corporations and politicians as equals behind closed doors. So this project, this effort, this public education effort is due in part to the work of a lot of people, including the work of some tremendous activists who stood out there and said no to ALEC in Cincinnati two years ago this month. CMD launched this project with the nation uh, in July of 2011. Uh, we um, analyzed over almost 1,000 bills. We documented over 500 voting corporations. We created entries on more than 1,000 lawmakers. We analyzed every bill. The bills cover a lot of areas that my colleagues here are going to talk about, including guns, crimes, prisons, and immigration. Uh, CMD helped connect the dots on the Trayvon Martin shooting, which really helped break the story into the broader media, uh, along with tremendous work by the folks on this panel. Uh, democracy, voting rights, and federal power, workers' rights, consumers' rights, anything that you really care about, they were trying to dismantle. Environment, energy, and agriculture, health, pharmaceuticals, safety net programs, privatizing public education, uh, taxes and budgets. You can't really read it down there, but one of their bills is, to, uh, is an absolute opposition to, windfall, to, to taxes on windfall profits of oil companies. Can't have that. Um, tort reform, uh, making it harder for you to sue if, you're, if your loved one is killed or injured. It's a lot of work. Trade and international relations, every single uh, proposal to basically help export our jobs overseas, they backed. Um, telecom, which Tim is going to talk about, a huge part of their agenda. So the Center for Media Democracy spent the last two years producing over 250 articles about ALEC. We have been the research engine of this project along with some of the tremendous research that Common Cause and other groups have done. I'm not going to go through and obviously read all these, but just so you know, we've been very, 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 very very, very hard at work. And we've also been working on uh, helping to tell the story in the mainstream media. Um, and this is just a sampling of some of those clips. And we have ongoing projects that are going to be, that are either underway right now or are uh, coming soon, including the expose we announced this week on the State Policy Network, which is the state echo chamber um, that uh, the, the right wing uses to echo the ALEC agenda. We issued a report showing financial, uh, I would call them surprising financial findings about the Goldwater Institute, which managed to take a million dollars in attorney's fees for killing part of Arizona clean election law and then paid their top lawyer bonuses of $50,000 and $35,000. Kind of interesting. You might want to check it out. And we also plan to continue our work uh, with um, uh, the social media efforts and our work on state reports uh, with, the, with the progress groups and uh, more and more research to help tell this story, including the, including the report we jointly released this week. Um, in Arizona uh, with all the groups that are on the uh, board there. We have uh, more coming on the Alex scholarships where corporations pay um, money to lawmakers basically into a fund that then funds their trips where they go off and vote as equals with uh, politicians. Um, and we have more creative uh, video that we'll be producing this year including you should check out the Alec Rock video. I worked on that with Mark Fiore and with the um, Utah uh, Progress affiliate and uh, I said that maybe the bill that kills the bill should be a dollar bill. So uh, that video is on alecexposed.org. Please check it out. And since this project began, more than 1,000 news stories and blog entries have been written about Alec uh, since we launched in, Ju in July 2011. You can just look at the huge peak in media. That's due to our work and the work of a, a number of groups here. 
When you Google Alec, Alec Baldwin is no longer at the top. He says I'm frustrated in that little sign. And there's been an explosion in the use of the word exposed, even on Rolling Stone uh, this month. So uh, please uh, check out our work online, follow us on Facebook, uh, and help me introduce and welcome Rashad Robinson, who's been crucial to uh, having 44 corporations drop out of Alec. Um, I think we're having some problems making it full screen, but we'll do our best. Um, <clears throat> how's everyone doing? Great. It's great to be with you. Um, my name is Rashad Robinson. I'm executive director of colorofchange.org. Color of Change is the largest online civil rights organization. We have over 850,000 members all around the country, and we work to mobilize folks to make government, corporations, and and sort of the general uh, public more accountable to black Americans and their allies. Um, we were founded in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina uh, when there was this recognition that there was really a lack of um, this mobilizing force within the civil rights community to take that moment and translate it into a movement. And since then, we've led a variety of campaigns that many of you have seen, including the two-year corporate campaign that ended Glenn Beck's time on Fox News by getting over 200 <laughs> advertisers to um, make um, a highly rated show on Fox no longer profitable for the network. Um, you know, I want to first just start off by saying that you know this this campaign would have not been possible if if Lisa Graves and the Center for Media and Democracy had taken all that research and kept it to themselves. But by by putting it um, out for the public and 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 exposing Alec. It gave many organizations, including mine, the ability to really research and find the strategic insights and the ways in which we were going to be able to take this organization on. And so, all right. So, you know, I'm not going to go into all the background around Alex. Lisa did that well. But it's, you know, this 40-year-old white ring organization that really exists underground. It's part of a, the vast industry of organizations on the right that have really pushed um, legislation and changed our culture in ways that put so many of our communities in harm's way. And, you know, over the course of that um, time, you know, Alec has become incredibly influential by taking corporate funds, um, moving those corporate funds to politicians who then take them to um, state government and pass all sorts of laws that put our communities in harm's way. And um, including, you know, um, disenfranchisement laws, uh, prison laws, um, laws around attorney general, um, education. You know, the money flows to the politicians, to the state governments, and then these laws sort of pop up. Um, And, you know, in terms of, of helping us um, figure this out, it was really conversations that we had at the Center for American Progress and with um, the Center for Media and Democracy around ALEC as we, as an organization, were trying to figure out what we were going to do about the voter ID laws. They were popping up all around the country. There was no clear theory of change for us as an advocacy organization to fight back against those laws because they were going, they were becoming part of, of the process in Tea Party legislatures that were not really going to listen to an organization that was elevating the voices of black folks. In fact, that was the whole purpose, was to prevent black folks from being able to have a voice. And so we, um, and so we you know, started our conversation really because of the great research work. And on November 7th, we started a conversation 
um, both with our members and with these corporations. We started by picking 15 of the corporations that Lisa and her, and her staff exposed, and we sent letters and started behind the scenes conversations with these corporations. They would say things to us like, as we started to talk, you know, we give money to the left, then we give money to the right. And we would say, you know, there's not really two sides to black people voting in this upcoming election. And, um, and, so, as, and so as we started to have that conversation publicly, we went out, we went out pu privately, we went out publicly to our membership. And we went out with a petition to stop corporate funded voter suppression, but we didn't expose any of the corporations. We kind of kept it secret. They said, which corporations? We kept telling the media, no, there was AP stories, but we wanted to have these behind the scenes conversations so none of the corporations could say, oh, well, we didn't know that we were part of ALEC, or it was a rogue vice president of government affairs who had joined, and, and we don't really, we don't really want to participate. We had had paperwork of back and forth letters, of conversations. So by the time we went public, um, you know, these corporations um, could no longer say that they, um, that they weren't part of ALEC. There were many organizations that support us. Initially, Credo was incredibly supportive. They went out to their members um, as well, and they actually just had people sign the Color of Change petition, which was, in the online organizing world, kind of a, a step beyond sometimes what we normally do. And, and there, a lot of credit goes to Becky Bond and her team for helping us really increase our numbers. On, on the 25th um, of January, Pepsi told us behind the scenes that they were going to be leaving Alec. It was a lot of conversation, but they said they were leaving. So what happens when you get Pepsi to leave Alec? Well, who's your first corporation you go after, right? It's probably Coke. Um, and so we decided to start letting Coke know and challenging for Coca-Cola what a, what, a, what a public conversation might look like. And um, during that time of back and forth with Coke and many other corporations, the tragedy of Trayvon Martin happened. And our organization immediately started mobilizing around that. We mobilized over 250,000 of our members to fight for justice. We supported hoodie rallies around the country. And we worked to sort of really elevate and raise the voices of our membership in a variety of ways to tell the story, not just of Trayvon Martin, but to fight for the Trayvons that we don't know. At the same time, that connection was being made by, by CMD, by Media Matters, and others um, of the Stand Your Ground Law. And we instantly decided that it was time to really go public. And we sent Coca-Cola a behind the scenes kind of website of what, what their logo would look like and gave them 48 hours to leave Alec after a series of conversations. And, um, and we said, you know, we're gonna go public, um, but you have 48 hours to make a different choice. And they, they stalled and didn't make a different choice. And so we went out um, on April 6th, and um, within about five hours of starting to have our members call Coca-Cola and, and having a conversation with the media, Coca-Cola called me on my cell phone to say they were pulling out of Alec and to have our members stop calling them. Immediately, a variety of other corporations started to, started to make public statements as the media, you know, because of Lisa's great work, Common Cause and others, started to like, look at the corporation and say, who's next? Um, Kraft said that they were, um, they were not going to leave Alec, and so we announced that they were going to be next. And within about eight hours, Kraft pulled out of Alec. And over the course of the next couple of weeks, a variety of corporations pulled out. Corporations would also start saying things like, you know, we pulled out of ALEC a year ago. Um, that CMD and Color of Change, they have bad information, and, and, that, and you should really check it. And McDonald's actually did that. They told the press that they had pulled out and we had bad information. The only problem was we had this behind-the-scenes strategy with letters. And so we had a letter from about two weeks prior on McDonald's stationery from their chief diversity officer defending their relationship in ALEC. And so the corporations clearly weren't talking to themselves. Um, and, you know... Oh, we ran, we ran radio ads against the corporations. The mainstream media really started to cover it. And, you know, to really wrap up and so we can get to questions, I want to just talk a little bit about the secret success, the secret of success to this, corpor to this campaign and other campaigns that we run at ALEC. And it's really four parts for us. 
it's strategic insight. And that strategic insight wouldn't have been possible without the research. Um, but the strategic insight really was that 98% of Alex funding comes from corporations. So every single day, these corporations who um, come to the black community and say, buy our products and use our resources, um, and use our services were saying also at the same time giving money to this shady organization that was carrying all sorts of legislation into uh, state houses around the country. And so we felt like, you know, you could have as many protests in front of Alex offices as you want, but Alex is not going to do what we want them to do. The corporations, however, had a stake in having a relationship with the black community. Deep research, and that deep research wasn't done by us, but it was done by a variety of organizations, um, and, um, and that research was really great for us to leverage. It was the media savvy of being able to tell a consistent story in the media, being able to talk over and over about how corporations were coming to black folks by day and asking us to buy their products and use their resources, and by night were passing these laws and, and supporting this organization that was putting our communities in a harm way. And for us at Color of Change, the most important thing was that we represent a constituency that exists in the real world. Because you see, corporations and, and, and political leaders and are, are, are designed, um, the, these, these organizations are designed to, um, to deal with constituencies that exist in the real world. So not kind of the left or the right, but, but to represent and deal with, you know, how do women feel when they see um, a bottle of Coke? How do black folks feel when they see the Walmart logo? How do Latinos feel when, um, when they see a state farm commercial? And so within each of these corporations, there was really sort of offices designed really to deal with our organization. And as we translated for them, both either behind the scenes or publicly, what the, what the campaign would look like, not only in the beginning, but throughout the process, many of them made the right decisions. Our membership was incredibly important. Over 200,000 of our members have participated in this campaign. They have done everything from make phone calls for weeks to corporations, to sign petitions, to donate money online so that we could run radio ads against Johnson & Johnson when they said they weren't going to leave. A week into those radio ads, um, Johnson & Johnson decided they were no longer going to be part of Alex. So it's really the power of that organized constituency, real voices that we raise to make real change. Um, I'm looking forward to the questions and also the, the ongoing conversation. But over the next couple of months and, and then over the next couple of years, um, Color of Change will continue to be focused not just on Alec, but the work that Alec has, has left us with in the states. Uh, you know, when Alec decided they were going to drop their public safety and elections committee, we were about 20 corporations in to the 44 that have dropped. And, and I um, went on MSNBC and they said, are you done? Because they are, they're dropping the, the committee. And we said, you know, Al it's like Alec went out into the water, they spilt a bunch of oil, and they said, you know what, now that we've been exposed, we're not going to spill any more oil. But we're not going to tell you how we're going to clean it up or how we're going to deal with the, the repercussions of how people are going to now live with the laws that we've put in place. And so we're going to continue to hold not only Alec accountable, but the kind of cousins of Alec out there who, who use corporate money, who use sh you know, shady backroom strategies that put us all in harm's way. So I want to thank anyone in this room that participated in this campaign, and in particular my colleagues up here who made this possible. Next, we're going to hear from Tim Carr, who, um, who is uh, part of Free Press, part of the organization that puts this together. He's a genius when it comes to telecom and media, and we're pleased to have you, Tim. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm Tim Carr. I'm with Free Press. Uh, first, a question. Is, is there anyone from Alec in the audience? A, a show of hands, please. Well, we know you're out there. Um, uh, so again, you know, I'm, I'm Tim Carr, I'm from Free Press. Now Free Press doesn't take any corporate money, we don't take any money from businesses. And we certainly don't endorse corporations, but every now and then when a company does the right thing, it's worth doing a product endorsement. So <laughs> I don't actually drink Coke, but nonetheless. So I'm going to report back from the field, and uh, the, there was a recent major victory against, against Alec. It was a victory in an unlikely place. It was in Georgia where there was a telecommunications bill in the State House 
that would have taken away communities ability to build community broadband networks um, it was the language of the bill was cut and paste from the alec playbook uh, and it was being pushed by a number of very powerful corporations down there names that you're probably familiar with at t verizon uh, windstream which is a uh, uh, pro uh, internet provider that's based mostly in the south and and you know we were watching this bill and in the parlance, parlance of the policy wonks it was a it was a slam dunk um, but a funny thing happened on the way to the governor's mansion the alec bill was crushed in a decisive vote 94 to 70 in atlanta this surprising victory marked the uh, this surprising victory marked the end of a string of alec bills that had successfully passed alec which receives you know, the financial support from some of the largest phone and cable companies, had managed to pass bills, uh, anti-municipal broadband bills, uh, in a number of states. Today, there, there are about 19 to 20 states that have bills that prevent cities from building their own community broadband networks. This is a largely as a result of, of Alex's efforts. And, and in, 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 in Georgia, the legislators who sponsored the defeated bill are major recipients of Alex's scholarships. They call these things scholarships. And Lisa, I'm sure you can tell us a lot more about what that involves. But it's usually, if you become an Alex scholar, it usually means that you're a, le a local legislator who accepts money to go to an Alec event where they wine and dine you and take you golfing and do all sorts of things. So it's a, uh, it doesn't seem very scholastic to me, but, uh, but that's what happens. Um, and the bill's, the bill's uh, main sponsor in Georgia was a guy by the name of Rep Representative Mark Hamilton. He had received $3,527.80 in Alex scholarships in 2008. And in the last electoral cycle, Hamilton was on the receiving end of thousands in campaign contributions from AT&T, 